Hey, how you doing? This is Ollie Bilson and I am with Mr. Tom Breeze. How you doing, Ollie? Good, I'm good. I always like to enter these episodes in with a Mr. and then... <laughs> okay. Always the same. It's always the same. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, gonna, it's, it's not going to change it. Actually, you know, I should just change my name and then, uh, then we have a really weird intro. But um, sure. yeah. <laughs> yeah, probably, the most, <laughs> probably the most amount of waffle we've ever started a, uh, a podcast with but well never dedicated listeners will know what it's all like <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sure. so um we um got done recording um the previous um podcast and i was re i was listening to it back and uh, one of the things we talked about was a question that i had for you which was really about the different options that are available to people with uh, youtube right now um, and and how they can best leverage those options because personally you know um the, there's a lot of talk about facebook and, and people have kind of you know certainly uh, those that have dialed in have, have certainly uh, are right they're profiting right now and they've been profiting for some time what the options are with Facebook but when it comes to YouTube there just seems to be you know some people are getting a bit confused they're not really sure about it maybe they're not really stepping into the platform they're not really sure how to use it they're not really sure what options are open to them um, and um, the, I'd, I'd like you to demystify it for us <laughs> okay um, so that we, we can talk a little bit about those options um, from a traffic standpoint um, and um, some examples of where we might take people and how we might use it um, through our marketing funnel. Yeah, cool. I think, I think that a lot of things have happened recently as well. So um, I know that I'm always having conversations with people who are kind of um, running agencies running traffic for clients on the Google Display Network or um, sometimes on YouTube as well. And we're always looking and finding these new areas that YouTube are always opening up. And I think that Facebook have had this big wave of activity of all this new type of ad um, creation that you, can, that you can use. YouTube's done a bit of it. A lot, like, when I say YouTube, I actually mean really part of AdWords. Um, so, at, so YouTube is like up to its game, Google is up to its game more recently, but the targeting options that are available to everybody have been there for quite some time. It's just there's not so much hype around it. I think that the interface of using Facebook is easier for most people. A lot of people are talking about it, lots of people getting some amazing results, and it is an amazing platform, right? I'm not going to deny that. Um, but it's not as big as Google. Um, where and you start using a display network, which is kind of, um, it's where all these websites are generating money themselves, like blogs and review sites, they're generating money themselves by having really good content and then showing ads, which are typically part of the Google display network. Um, so it means that you can, as an advertiser, you can have your ads on so many different websites because Google um, ads are allowed to show on those websites. So it means your reach can be vast and you can, it's like really endless amounts of traffic that you can generate. Um, and it's all a case then of like, right, what are the targeting options and how can we get in front of our audience in the right way? Um, because I think that Facebook's an easier one to master. It means that it will have a, um, like a half-life in terms of like how long you can advertise on that platform cost-effectively. It will kind of be quite quick, I think, because um, whilst they keep on creating lots and lots of different ways of creating um, ads, there doesn't seem to be quite so much in terms of like, well, once you're on Facebook, it's got the news feed and it's got the right-hand side, but it's kind of a lot of the advertising goes on inside of Facebook. And right now it's a very, very popular platform, which is great. So it's got Instagram and it's got their um, preferred network as well. So that's growing, which is great, but it, it, cause it is an easier platform. Lots of people are playing in that marketplace. And the chances are it's going to get saturated. So learning to diversify and kind of like um, learning how to advertise in different spaces um, is always going to be really, really useful to do that. And, um, and hopefully I can, if no one, if people are listening and they're not yet advertising on YouTube or the display network, hopefully this will give people an idea of what's available to them when it comes to that time when they're like, do you know what, I'm ready to go and do it now. Um, there's a lot out there that can be just amazing and it gives you that opportunity when you do get it right it's one of those places where you can scale at a ridiculous rate um, like with with Facebook a lot of people start scaling and they'll see things like ad fatigue where the results just don't hold up um, over a period of time or they just can't get in front of their audience because you're getting in front of people who are interested and not necessarily ready to buy 
that's a difficult audience to convert and you need to be really good with your marketing. Whereas with YouTube and Google, sometimes people don't need a hell of a lot of convincing in order to buy. Like if you're a locksmith, for example, you're going to do so much better on Google and YouTube than you are going to do on, on Facebook because there aren't that many people who are really interested and passionate about locksmiths. <laughs> it doesn't really happen quite so much. Um, whereas people go to Google because they're like, I need a locksmith like now uh, because I've just locked myself out or I need to change the locks because my boyfriend or girlfriend is gone crazy and I don't want to, <laughs> do you know what I mean? There's so many scenarios like that. Um, but there's so many different businesses that would do so much better on somewhere like YouTube and Google because people are searching for that topic and, and it's an easy game to win when it's just pure search. But then the real masters will work out how to kind of get the Google Display Network working really effectively um, yeah. because that really is like an endless um, supply of cost-effective customers. And um, so that's hopefully what I can demystify for you. Yeah, sure. We'll talk about it in a little bit more detail. Well, I've actually got a really painful story about um, the Google Display Network, actually, which I'll share with you. Um, but, <laughs> I think everyone has. I think yeah, like, yeah, it's sure. kind of like, it's a difficult one to master, but yeah, it's carry on. It's a difficult one to master. So um, we've been running Google AdWords campaigns for, well, since 2002. So we've been going for a long time in, the, in, in, in that, uh, in that for, uh, in that media and advertising, um, <clears throat> and um, the reason why I think this is such a valuable episode for people listening is because hopefully what what we'll do is talk about those those different options that are available to you, where they're applicable, um, and how you're going to use them at different points. And, and for me, um, how I wasted so much money, um, I think it was actually back in 2003, um, was there just wasn't a lot of education around um, how best to use um, Google. I mean, it was, to all intents and, pur and purposes, to me, we'd be running it. I thought we were running it effectively. It was profitable. It was very cheap back then. Um, and um, we were running the search network for, you know, intentional search queries. And um, our Google rep, um, who and I was managing our advertising at the time, just sort of said, hey, you, you guys should really try the display network. Um, and um, I was like, well, that sounds like a good idea. I mean, we're absolutely crushing it with everything we could do. And we were in a market, such a niche where we could only advertise, like there was pretty much all the impressions that we had. We were number one. Um, and we just, we couldn't spend enough money. Like our budget. You the share of the impressions, right? So you yeah. were the ones at the top. You were yeah. kind of like, yeah, you're doing your job. Right? Yeah. Where? There was nowhere else that I could go, um, and I was spending as much money as I could possibly spend. I couldn't spend any more, and frankly, it wasn't a lot of money. Um, but it was a niche for sure. And so the, the Google rep had said, "Hey, well, you know, we should, um, you should expand this," um, and um, he suggested the Google Display Network. So quickly, we you know made some banners and kind of got out there on the d display network, and it was very very interesting. <laughs> so what what I mean by that is I, I didn't necessarily have the know how that I have now. Unfortunately, you know one of my best friends, Tom, you are the man when it comes to this stuff. I didn't have a Tom back then. <laughs> me and me, me myself and I. Um, and, um, you know, foolishly, I, I wasn't really thinking about uh, what we spoke about before are really those moments that, that, that people have uh, at different stages of, of their decision-making process. I, didn't, I wasn't really thinking about that. I was coming at it from a very kind of search-led query kind of um, place. I, I wasn't thinking about anything else. And if anything, I should have been thinking about it a bit more like Facebook now, where people, they're a long way out in the decision-making process. You're really targeting kind of interest stuff. Um, and I didn't get that. So for probably about a year, no joke, I just spent a sh I can't say it. Not. <laughs> um, on um, on the display network and, and it just didn't work because that message would have never worked there because I was just so used to pounding the same message out through the through the, through the search network and it just didn't work 
So that's my that's my story. Um, yeah. I'd like to tell you, like, it was a lot of money. Like, if I said the number now, it might not seem as much. But the way I calculated it back then was if you knew how cheap I was getting leads for. Yeah, <laughs> like, precisely. It's all relevant. So um, it just didn't work. So that's my story. If, if you compare somewhere like Search on Google and YouTube to the display network when you're targeting by different like a variety of different options um it's like you're dealing with a pond versus the ocean it's kind of like in the pond it's like easy pickings it's kind of like right you're, you're there in front of people when they want you great that's it couldn't be better um there is a bit of that on the google display network as well um but you to really crack it big time you're looking at kind of like getting people based on they could be interested in what you've got and if your message is really good and clear and your funnel's good um when I say funnel, it could be like you're, it's just really more of an experience and how you're treating that traffic that does come through. If, you, if you've got that all dialed in, then um, you're going to be much better set to get the best results. But because it is such a big, wide space, um, you've got to be a little bit careful about exactly how you target. Um, and somewhere like YouTube ad campaigns that we run will be run in a very different way to a display network campaign because um, you're just dealing with a with a bigger beast, you're, de you're dealing with so much more traffic. And so you need to segment very quickly, very early on and have a message that c connects with that very well as well. Um, so, and, th and there's no such real, there's no real such thing as a shortcut. So many times we get kind of a, a good result with a client and they're like, Oh my God, can we spend five times that much on in that area? Like not yet. Not, I've got to let it rest and be it as it is for five days. Then I can up it a little bit. <laughs> then I can up it. If you try and go too quick, you're working with the algorithm. Google will do their best to help you as you grow. Um, but if you push it too quick and the algorithm just tries to find you more traffic really quickly and it ends up going for the crappy tra traffic to try and fulfill your budget that you want to fulfill. So you, you've got to grow it slowly. Um, but when I say slowly, it's kind of like, it's like that compounding interest type idea. So it's like you increase it by 20% every week, for example. And very soon, within like a few, like a couple of months, you're, you're, dealing with such huge volumes of traffic that's still converting really well, it's great. Just you have to have that level of patience to be like, it's going to start small, grow it. And there's no such thing as a short cut with a display network for sure. You can't just kind of like say, wow, we're getting really good result here. And it's saying it can spend a thousand dollars a day. And you're like, just wait, just, just slowly build. Um, otherwise it will just bite you in the ass. And it has bit me in the ass many times. Don't get, don't get me wrong. Um, uh, but I, I kind of come back and I learn from my mistakes. I, I think I learn from my mistakes, but um, it's always so tempting to be like, oh, I'm just going to add a bit more spend there. But you've got to be got to be really careful with it. Um, yeah, I think what's interesting, we had a conversation not so long ago, actually, and, and we still have um, a lot of success with, uh, with search with Google. Um, it's one of our main um, lead sources that, that, that we, uh, funnily enough, actually, we, yes, although we lead gen, effectively and affordably through the search uh, Google search network um, we uh, we actually convert with remarketing so yeah. we actually convert with Facebook remarketing but we lead generate with Google um, and oh, yeah. we move people through the funnel very effectively with remarketing on Facebook and basically changing the platform round um, for, for, for further conversions but um, one of the conversations we had, and just to open people's minds out to what we're going to talk about when we hit these these three different options that are available to us uh, with YouTube specifically, is is that um, sometimes you need somebody who is outside of your business to give you some perspective on some of this stuff, because probably like me and some people listening to this may well be doing well on Facebook. They may well be getting some traction and action through Google. Um, and it's not that people are close to the idea of new things, but sometimes you just need some perspective on what the, you know, the, the, the real opportunity is. And I know that you've even be some, been surprised from some of the clients that you've worked with, how effective YouTube can really be, even though you fully believe it, you endorse it, and you, you, you are probably the, 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 the world's best person, renowned person for, for, for YouTube, Actually, the truth is, is that even now when we speak, it's like, hey, because some of the changes as well help you 
um, to get some of those results and you can act on them so quickly, you're at the cutting edge of it. Even now you're like, yeah, you know, we spoke about this, the client wasn't, you know, didn't really think of that or they hadn't really thought about doing this before and they, you know, they, they got you in and, and you took them through these three different kind of options we're going to talk through and they had fantastic results. So, you know, what I'd say is if you've never thought about advertising on YouTube before, just uh, play closer attention. <laughs> this yeah, yeah. Well, it's very kind of you to say that. I think that like one of the things we, we work with some big names and um, it's really interesting. Sometimes I say to them, okay, so here's what we're going to be focusing on over the next couple of days. We're going to start building out campaigns that do this and we're going to go for something like we'll talk about it in a minute, like a customer affinity audience. And they're like, what's a customer affinity audience? And I'm like, oh, well, basically what we do is this, this, and they're like, oh my God, you can do that. I'm like, yeah. And they're like, right, okay, how do we, how do we maximize that as best as possible? And it, it's just people don't know what's available to them. And everyone, well, everyone who's in the advertising game knows a lot about uh, Facebook because you've got kind of like um, your interest targeting, demographic targeting, location targeting, then you've got your lists and you've got your remarketing and all that sort of and lookalike audiences and things. And so you've got kind of a, a and it's a great platform to be on because it's got such a lot of engagement, but people aren't in that search mode. With YouTube and the Google Display Network, you've got all of that as well and, and more, um, but people don't realize it. So hopefully we can go into some of this stuff and, and talk about the options um, and talk about how to use those options as well and where we see best results uh, based on what clients we're working with. Um, now, the obvious ones to begin with, like the standard, bog standard, this is what you can do, um, comes down to demographics. So um, ages are broken into different categories. Um, it's like 18 to 24, 25 to 36, or 34, 35 to um, 50, I think. I can't remember exactly all the categories, but you've got kind of like five or six categories based on age brackets. Um, so you can't define it quite as well as Facebook, where they'll say specifically what age people are at. Um, but it just brackets them together, and normally that's good enough to go with. Um, I rarely advertise to 18 to 24-year-olds just because you tend to find they they're not quite so affluent if they're going to buy a, a product. Um, and um, likewise, with a, with a much older category, um, like 65 and over, <laughs> not that that's that old, don't get me wrong, but like um, those people don't tend to be quite so savvy with online purchases, which most of my clients tend to be doing as well. Um, or in the game for marketing, typically. Um, so um, that's just a kind of a bit of a feel for um, age groups. Um, you've obviously got male and female, um, and then you've also got um, unknown as well, which is where they just don't know based on that user profile, whether they're male or female. Um, then you've got parental status, whether they're a parent or not. And, um, and then you've got your location targeting as well, which means basically you can go down to a zip code or a postcode, uh, that sort of targeting or you can go as wide as the whole world and you can select different pockets. You can eliminate or exclude certain states or certain towns or postcode or zip codes. You can be really, really, really specific with all of this. Um, I would say the more, more um, permutations you put into the algorithm of Google, like the more targeting options you're putting in, then you tend to find it doesn't perform quite so well for you because it's just being, it's being restricted too much. And you can dealing with software and software can be a bit buggy sometimes. So, trying to really say, I just want to advertise to these three different locations in different parts of the world and just go to be very specific with who you're targeting. You might just not get any traffic whatsoever. You might just be a bit too far targeted. Um, so it's good to keep a consideration of that. And I wouldn't necessarily use location targeting too much um, unless, apart from the really obvious ones, so to speak. So like if it's a country, great, that makes it easy. If it's a certain city, great, that makes it easy. But I wouldn't go into like this state and this state and this state. I, I think I'll go for the whole of kind of like, um, well, do it in a slightly different way where you're kind of like maybe break it into three different campaigns. But I'd, I'd try and not challenge the algorithm too much on that. Um, something they brought out more recently, and this kind of went under the radar completely, but you can advertise um, in the US by um, household income. So it's HHI, household income, and you can do it based on um, the top 10%, uh, next 20%, 30%, 40%, 50%, and then everybody. So that lower 50%, you might say, well, let's turn off that because we don't want to advertise to people that have uh, a lower household income because they might not be able to afford our products, for example. So you can segment by household income as well. Um, and um, 
there's yeah so that kind of like wraps up a little bit about demographics so you've got age gender location and household income which is always a useful one to know um in terms of other types of targeting um you've got um well let's start with kind of start with um search to begin with which is like cold traffic people that don't know you um you're going to want to use two types of targeting for cold traffic and that's either going to be keyword driven so based on people's searches, so what they're typing in to Google or YouTube, um, based on what they're typing in, you might want to get in front of them with different ads. Um, now on YouTube, if you do that by keywords and you want to get in front of people, there's two types of ads. You've got the discovery ads, which are the ones that will come up at the top of the search results page. Um, so there's normally two at the top of the search results page. You can be there. Um, and also you can be on the right-hand side um, when someone is watching a video already, you can be there on the right-hand side as well based on keywords. But what's important to note is that if you're appearing at the top of the search results and you've decided to advertise for a particular keyword, you're showing up because of the keyword that the user's typed in. If you're deciding to come up on the right-hand side of a video that, like, of a video they're already watching, you're coming up based on the keyword that the video has. Um, and that's decided by the person that created the video in the first place. So if they put a tag in there that is, um, let's say, um, how to bake a cake, for example, and your video is about how to bake a cake, and there's a, there's a good match, then great, if that video is about how to bake a cake. But let's say, for example, that video is not about how to bake a cake, but instead um, how to grow your own vegetables, and you've got an ad showing there to how, how to bake your own cake, you'll probably find there won't be such a good connection there and so really the person that created the video in the first place, you're at their whim based on what keywords they've decided their video is about. So that you tend to find you get much less relevancy there, but sometimes it's such good quality, um, not quality traffic, but such cheap traffic, that sometimes you can be like, well, it doesn't really bother me. I might have to pay a little bit more, but it still turns into and converts into customers cost effectively. So that's sometimes worth considering. Um, on Google, of course, you've got the Google um, search results page, which is like, I think everyone's familiar with that. So they type in a keyword into google.com, for example, and then at the top of the search results on the right-hand right -hand side as well, sorry, you're going to have, you can have your ad there, typically a text ad, but you can have other types of ads there as well um, with like shopping ads, for example. Um, and you can also um, it kind of come up on different search-based um, like you can have like a Google search tool inside of a website. And then again, you can show up for those ads as well, sometimes as well. Um, I don't do a huge amount of that because we really are specialists at video. We do kind of like test it every now and again, but I don't know enough information about that in order to guide people on that front. But that's all based on keywords. Um, and then you can also advertise based on placements, which is the other type of search traffic for cold traffic. Now, placement is basically saying, I want to appear in that area where you point out based on a URL. Um, so on YouTube, you can literally choose the videos you want your pre-roll ad to appear in front of, um, which is really, really powerful because you can select all your competitors' videos and make sure that your video appears in front of their video, which is really cool. Um, and um, also you can do it uh, with the display network as well. So you can say, I want my image ads or my text ads or my video ads to appear on that website there. Now you can even go to the kind of like uh, the placement itself and say that page on that website, um, which is obviously quite powerful because if you know that a very popular blog like entrepreneur.com has got <clears throat> an article on there that's specifically about the topic that your business does, then of course you might want to show your ad there and know that you want to get a really good quality audience clicking on your video ad or your ad on that website. Um, so for one of our clients, if they're kind of selling how to do webinars, for example, and there's um, a blog post about the best webinar software, for example, we might say, great, well, based on that URL of that website reviewing the best webinar software out there, we want to show our ad next to that content. And you're just going to get a really good result from that sort of targeting like that. Um, so that's placement targeting. So you can do it by keyword or placement for that search traffic, and that tends to work really, really well. Um, any questions so far, Ollie? No, I, I'm totally down with what you're saying. I think that um, it, it's important to really just you know, conceptualise kind of the state of the state of search and state of YouTube, really, just so that everybody understands 
where that is um, because search is very different from um, uh, display and, and, and YouTube is uh, it really offers so many options. I mean, one of the things and one of the takeaways for people there is with placements, <clears throat> the ability to serve a pre-roll advert based on URLs of videos that you know are uh, getting traction or are getting attention uh, as a result um, that people are uploading those videos um, and uh, that, that they could be your competitors is something that um, is a big, big, big take. You know, lots of businesses are using YouTube right now anyway, so why not? Get in front of each of their adverts, uh, each of their, each of their, sorry, each of their videos with an advert uh, to capture their attention. My question about that tactic would be knowing well that you're choreographing it so well that you're going to put yourself in front of that video that, that that's going to be loading. Can you give um, two answers? One, um, which is what should you probably put in that video? Um, and uh, and two, how do you pay for that video? Do you pay every time it's served? Do you pay for how long it runs for? Do you pay if somebody clicks? Um, so what is the uh, what should go in it? How do they pay for it? And also the other thing is probably what should be the call to action? Should it be an annotation? Should there be a button? Should there be a link? What's the best thing? Good questions. Okay, so um, in terms of, uh, let me tackle the price one first. So um, with a dis discovery ad, which used to be called an in-display ad, uh, like the video there, um, you'll pay when someone decides to click to press play on your video um, with, with that type of ad. So that's like a pay-per-click model, and as soon as they click it, you'll pay, and then they start watching your video. Um, with in-stream, you only pay when someone watches past 30 seconds of your video. Um, so it means you're, it's what they call a true view. So if someone decides to click um, skip ad before 30 seconds is up, so like 20 seconds in or 29 seconds in, if you really want to go that far, um, and they press skip ad, it won't cost you a penny. Um, and there's a lot of data out there talking about the power of the impression anyway. So you've got your brand out there in front of somebody, um, and it can be really, really powerful. A lot of questions I tend to get from people at that point as well. Um, once you've created a video that's less than 30 seconds <laughs> to try and gain the system, uh, you'll end up paying once someone gets to the end of your video if it was 20 seconds in length, for example. Can you build uh, an audience from the people that watched it but didn't take action? Yes, exactly, yeah. So you can take an audience, you have to do it in a manual way, so you'd say, let's take everybody who watched that video as an ad or as a, as a normal viewer, if your video is live as well on YouTube, for example, uh, like in your channel, for example, you can segment by loads of different re like ways. So you can say if they liked your video, if they subscribed to your channel, if they all that sort of stuff. But you could, yeah, you, what we do a lot is to say, everyone that's watched that video as an ad, let's make an audience of those people. It has to be people that have watched past 30 seconds. And then you would exclude all the people that um, went to the website. So that you can then say, right, these are the people that watched the video ad past 30 seconds but didn't click back to the website. Right. And with that audience, you probably don't want to show the same ad to them again. You might want to show a different video ad to them. But now you can talk with them based on not having to advertise in the expensive areas, which is like saying based on a keyword or based on a placement, you can do it based on a remarketing list at that point. So, um, yeah, you can, you can take people like that and take that journey. But this is why we always think about the media planning beforehand and really think about what customer journey we want to build for people and put those contingencies in place to say, well, once they watched the video but didn't click back to the website, we don't want to keep on bombarding them with the same video ad all the time. So you can exclude them from that campaign um, and say, right, they're not going to see that video ad again, but instead they're going to start to see this video ad, which is a slightly different experience for that person. Um, still might be promoting the same thing, but with a different type of message or follow up to that based on the fact that you know they watched your first video. So you can, you can be really, really eloquent, eloquent about... Um, uh, eloquent, elegant. Uh, I don't know what I'm trying to say now, Ollie, but <laughs> it's, you can be very, very uh, clever <laughs> in the way that uh, you you advertise to people. Um, so you can really build that customer journey that's very, very specific to their journey, and it makes them feel really, really kind of like you're, you're taking care of them, so to speak. So, um, so going, yeah. going kind of into the, the the question about you know somebody thinking about doing a pre-roll ad um, in front of their competitors what would be the best way to structure that advert to ensure that 
somebody continues to watch it and more importantly that they then decide to take some action on the back of it. Okay, so what I think I'll do, if this is okay with you, is I'll explain the other types of targeting because based on the knowledge you have about how you're getting in front of your customers will determine how you create the video ad. And um, it makes a massive difference if you pay, if you know what sort of traffic you're getting in front of, whether it be search traffic, whether they've engaged with you before, like a video uh, that we just talked about with like some remarketing, or based on the fact that they've never heard of you before and they're not even searching for this stuff, the videos need to be different. And, and I can talk about how to structure those videos if you like, once we're through the targeting options. Yeah, great. Let's, um, let's, let's kick into the, the second, do, uh, we want to second targeting option. Though. Yeah, I mean, the next logical one to talk about would be um, the people that have kind of engaged with you in some way before. Either they've seen your videos online, they've subscribed, um, or maybe they've visited your website before um, and you've pixeled them with your, uh, with your remarketing pixel. Um, or they might be on your list already and uh, they might not be engaging or they may be engaging, but you want to kind of get in front of them in different ways. Basically, it's the people that have engaged with you in some way. Um, because they're on your list already, they know, hopefully, like and trust you. Um, and getting an offer in front of them is a good idea, basically. So um, they, this is like a much smaller audience, um, but you know they're a very... Um, interested and motivated audience and also know who you are. It's like a small group of people that are very close to making a decision to buy from you. They're on your database, they've engaged with you in some way and they liked what they saw and therefore they're going to be primed to, um, to see an offer from you. And this kind of comes down to um, what AdWords would call um, your remarketing, your remarketing audiences. So this could be your database, your list that you've uploaded via Google Match and um, it will have that account, have those lists for you. Um, or it might be people that have visited your website or engaged with your video ads in some way. You can build audiences based off all of that information. So these are people that we know are, um, who know of you, who are interested in what you have and are close to making a buying decision. So um, you can kind of have those audiences loaded up inside of um, your AdWords account and run lots of different types of ads to them, including video ads. And um, so you can do text ads, image ads, there's all other types of ads as well, like responsive ads and light box ads, which we won't go into all that detail just yet. Um, but you know that that's that audience there that you can target basically. Um, and it tends to be a very, very hot audience. So I'm more than happy to pay a little bit more money on that audience um, because it, in the end they come in cheaper typically, but they're always, um, because they already know, like, and trust you, um, the chance of having an ad there to promote something that's going to turn into a sale is so much more likely. And right. so you're not necessarily going for lead gen anymore. You're, li you're literally saying, right, I want to target these people who to buy this particular product. And that's the, the plan for that particular campaign. Yeah. Um, and so you would treat that tra traffic slightly differently than you would a search traffic. With search, you know, they're motivated, but they may not know who you are just yet. With a remarketing list, um, we know they already know who you are and they're motivated. Um, because they're on your list and they've, they've expressed an interest and we can get an offer in front of them. So it's just a hotter audience and it's close to making a buying decision. Yeah, sure. That's, um, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I, can, I can see how that would be relevant and I think it gives people some perspective on, 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 those, on those different targeting options. So talk to me a little bit about the third kind of way in which that we can, we, we can think about search. Yeah, so this is um, where it gets a oh. bit. Yeah, sorry. So, so this is where it gets a little bit about the algorithm and the data that Google have already. Um, so this is where it's cold again. It's cold traffic. They don't know who you are, um, and they might have indicators to say they could be interested in what you have, but they're not yet in a um, decision-making mode. They're not even researching. Um, your products or anything like that. They're, they're just kind of like, hey, look, they could be interested um, in what you have to offer. And there's a variety of different ways that you can use Google's data to help you. Um, one thing we just spoke about there was uploading lists um, to um, Google and also um, and your AdWords account and also having remarketing lists. And as soon as you start building those, Google will take that data and they'll build what's called similar to audiences or just similar audiences. 
And so it's very much like a lookalike audience on Facebook. They didn't used to perform well at all. Now they perform really well. Um, so five or six months ago, we gave it a little test with some big clients and nothing really happened. Um, and we always kind of tried to make it work, but nothing really was coming to fruition on those types of campaigns. But now we can literally run video ads directly to similar audiences without any other filtering in place. And it can convert incredibly well. Um, so the beauty of that is that um, those audiences are so much bigger. Um, so you might have a list of, let's say, I don't know, let's say 50,000 people. That's quite a large list for most people, yes. probably bigger than most people listening. You don't need this to be that big. But if you have that sort of size, you, it might give you a list of people that would be, I don't know, like 2 million people, for example, that you can advertise to who are very similar looking based on Google's data to that audience you've already got. Now, of course, if you have a big quality list, that's great. I would say when you upload them, upload your customer database as well as your prospect database and then all together as one again. Um, so you'd almost have like three lists from one list um, because if you build a list of your customers, it's likely to be higher quality than if you build a list of your prospects. Yes. Um, likewise, what will also happen is that it will start collecting um, audiences who have converted on your site. Say, for example, you've put a conversion pixel for when someone buys a particular product from you then it'll collect that audience and it'll build a similar audience to those people. So say, for example, you've got a lead, but then you might have a $97 product, for example, it'll, and, you're, and you're seeing the conversions happen on that particular product. When that, once that gets to a critical mass and it's a big enough audience, then Google will come around and say, all right, well, look, you've had a thousand people buy that. Now um, we can build a list of those people and build a similar to audience but now, because everyone's been through the process that Google have seen, and they've got so many more data points on them, they can build a much better quality audience right. to you. Yeah, um, that makes a lot of sense. So, yeah, so you've got, got this kind of like, if your list convert, if your similar audience to your list that you've uploaded works, fantastic, you're off to the races and you can start getting going. If you need to get some conversion data going through, that conversion data is normally very, very powerful. So what ends up happening is your, your account will actually mature with time to right. the point where you start building, as soon as you start getting better conversions, you start getting more conversions. Then you start getting better lists and more conversion and more scope and more scale. And, and all of a sudden you're like, right, well, I don't have to rely so heavily on Google's kind of like targeting all the time. Now I can rely on the similar audience that's getting bigger and bigger every day. And because it's, it's almost like optimizing itself as it goes as well. So <laughs> it's really clever like that. Um, yeah. So, um, so there's, that's part of the algorithm that you can build, um, build out on those, on those processes. Um, there are also interests. So um, Google will have certain types of interest audiences um, already preloaded for you, which is always a good idea to kind of keep an eye on that because there's, there's an interest group in there that just really resonates with you. So like, say, for example, there's people that are in business world um, and you've got like um, business professionals might be one, for example. That's great. You want to, you obviously want to kind of like um, target that type of person because you might think, well, that could convert for me quite well. It doesn't always work that well, but keep an eye on things because different types of ads might work really well. Um, a Gmail ad, for example, to that side of type of audience might work really well. Um, it could be an interest in, in marketing and advertising, for example. I know that a few of my clients um, are in that space and we can we can kind of like use that interest um, to to run out to and see how we get on with there. Obviously you're going to a cold audience that's expressed an interest in something. Um, it's not always the best quality, um, but if you pay attention to what we're talking about in just a second where we can create ads that might be right for that audience, then it's um, a slightly different ball game and, and you can get to get to grips with getting a better result there. Um, you also have a similar thing, which is topics as well. So you've got topics that people might be interested in. You can advertise on those. Um, but the one that um, we find is really good to, to advertise on or start creating is what's called affinity audiences. Now, affinity audiences, very similar to interests or part of interests, um, and they'll kind of list out all the different types of interests you can get in front of. So similar to Facebook, how you might choose certain people's pages, and the following's there, and you might say, right, if people are interested in that, then I want to advertise to them. Um, Google don't do it in, su in such the same way, but they're saying, right, there's one, for example, like it might be a social media enthusiasts. If they're going to lots and lots of blogs about social media posts and how social media works, and 
they'll track all that data based on people's behavior. And they'll say, okay, well, those people are a social media enthusiast then because they're going to all these websites about social media stuff. We can pin them and say, right, they're interested in that topic. And normally it's pretty accurate, uh, which is great. So they've got like um, shutter bugs, they call it, which is like people really interested in, into photography. But you know people are going to blog posts about photography all the time and therefore advertising to that audience makes a lot of sense. Um, but you can do something really clever with something called a custom affinity audience. And a custom affinity audience is where you basically decide what sort of audience you want to build. So you can suggest to Google when you say, right, here's all the URLs um, of websites that I think my audience go to. So it might be something like um, HubSpot. For, I know you spoke that, about that in a previous episode. Um, it might be kind of Infusionsoft. It might be, if you imagine getting all the different CRMs that are popular with kind of entrepreneurial or small business owners, then you can say, well, anyone's going to those types of websites are going to be interested in marketing and interested um, in kind of email databases and things. And so therefore, they might be interested in what we have to offer. Or maybe you group together all the blogs that are popular in your niche. So um, digital markers might be one. Um, there's loads of SEO type um, blog posts out there as well. You can grab all of those and put them together and, um, and say, right, anyone that goes to those types of websites, please build an audience for me there as well. Yeah. Um, and you can mix it up with keywords as well. So you can say, you want to say these URLs and these keywords, can you build a list of audience that's like that? And if you, I mean, it's, it's not new, but it's kind of like, it's always difficult to build those audiences really effectively. But if you keep it quite niched in and you start focusing on various types of blogs or review sites, as well as some keywords, the audiences are massive. We're talking about like 500 million type audience sizes and things. So they're big old audiences. But if you build them, what you can do, um, you might not get a great result by advertising straight to those cold, um, but what you, and that goes for all different interests as well. But what you can do is you can like overlay different um, audiences. So you might say, right, people that are in this custom affinity audience that I've built, anyone who's in there, that big old group there, and when they go to these websites, and only when they go to these websites. So you can say, right, um, I only want to advertise on this, uh, to these type of people when they go to this type of website. Um, and when you do that, you can start to find you get still huge audiences to advertise to, and you know they're going to be that much more interested. They already go to loads of websites, and they're going to this particular website now as well. And when you do that and run ads to that sort of audience, plus all the demographic targeting you might have going on as well, you're not demanding too much of the algorithm. Sometimes you, it's a bit too much, but um, when you kind of hit that sweet spot, you, you'll find that if you can get that to convert well for you, it just feels like this endless supply of customers for you. It's kind of like that's the sort of time where you can scale up and spend those kind of like ridiculous amounts a day, like the $10,000 a day, $20,000, $50,000 a day type of advertising campaigns. Um, and, and that's where it kind of gets really exciting to scale. But um, it's rare and it's, it kind of takes a lot of work. We're literally talking about like the top 1% of the 1% type thing. Um, but when you get them to work and you can segment them and you say, wow, wow we can spend even if it's $200 a day and it's proven profitable for you, that's great. That's, that's going to be a profit on 200 pounds investment every single day or $200, $200 every single day. And, and you really, you built it and you let it go. And you might have a bit of ad fatigue in six months time or 12 months time, but it's not going to come round straight away. The ads might need refreshing every three to six months. The offer might need refreshing every 12 months. It's not hard to to, once it's been built, it's not like you're on Facebook having to constantly update things. You just have like, you've built this system that keeps on generating uh, traffic for you and good quality traffic as well. Um, what, what, so that's kind of like, I think we've covered most of the different types of um, ways of targeting there. Um, and hopefully that makes a lot of sense, but we can talk about the ads that you might run to those different types of audiences you can think of now. Yeah, sure. So I think, um, I think really that's the, that, that, that's the thing that, that, that hopefully some people will have some perspective on from listening to this is that, you know, um, well, well, firstly, when you step back from it, just really how powerful, um, the, that Google 
ha- you know, a lot of people talk about Facebook. Uh, a lot of people talk about them having, you know, so much data, and, and that, that's very true. Um, but but Google in itself, you know, coupled with with YouTube, um, have so many data points. And 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 as you mentioned there before, it, my takeaway really from that in terms of the uh, the, the affinity audiences is really just give you gives you that opportunity to overlay such large markets that then you can then do rules uh, combinations based on that to really dial into some of those niches whereas you know if you use them if you use some of that targeting alone you're kind of dealing with a C uh, uh, you know as you put it before an ocean of people and really what you want to be saying is well there's a whole heap of fish in here and and I just want those fish that have been to this shore and when they get there you know that that's where i'm going to make my catch um and um you know there's such a big opportunity there which i think is very uh, very um uh, obvious from from the way that you talk about it and the detail that that, that really you do need to go into to really fully appreciate it as well really well so, to, take, to take that metaphor a little bit further with the fish idea it's, it's like you know when fishermen go out and to begin with they might cast a load of bait out into the water just to attract all the fish to one location to begin with um, what also Google will do is they give you something called an in-market audience as well, um, which is very similar to a, an interest audience. It's slightly smaller, but it's um, grabbing a, an audience whereby that audience is is closer to a buying decision. So that in the, like they often go to these types of websites, but more recently they've been going to them quite a bit. Um, and they'll have what's called an in-market audience as well. Great for the e-commerce world, great for service-based businesses as well. Um, because you know that like, okay, say for example, you're selling to photographers. We talked about that earlier. They might like regularly go to, to blogs and stuff every now and again, based on the fact that like they love photography, they go to these certain blogs. And so Google can track that. Um, but then if they've really upped the game a little bit because they're looking to buy a new camera and they've gone to loads and loads of review sites over the last couple of weeks, they would fall into the in-market audience. Right. And so you can get them based on when they're a little bit more interested. They're kind of like, they're in a research mode. It's, yeah, sure. Again, it's not kind of like a proven science, like, oh my God, if you're going to advertise that audience, you're going to make a million right. overnight. But it's, you're going to get a slightly better audience. And it kind of gives you, uh, gives you those rules to play by. And if you, if you segment that with some clever keywords or placements and uh, with, um, with dem- different demographics and play around with it and do your due, dil- due diligence and don't um, try and kind of like say, well, I just want to get in front of men who are interested in photography. Right. We need to segment a little bit closer in than that because you've got such a vast you know, that's the sort of time when you can like say, am I, can I, my daily budget's a thousand dollars. You'll spend that a thousand dollars in less than an hour. <laughs> it's kind of like, that's how quick you can go. Um, so you just need to segment and segment and segment and then slowly open it out until like the, the traffic is at a steady stream that you can deal with. Yeah. Um, you know. So, um, what I want to do, if it's okay with you, um, we're a partnership in this, so I'm just not going to make the executive decision. Um, <laughs> what, I th- what I think, because th- there's a lot of things we've talked about there, I'd like to sort of summarize perhaps what is the one thing that somebody could take away from all of that that could be actionable, that they could go and do right now that's a must. And then, secondly to that, if you concur, is that we take the um, the, the idea of what adverts to create for those different um, uh, th- th- those different audiences that we could possibly target um, at the stages and the moments they are, and probably move that into a different podcast. So, yeah. so I'd really like to dial into that because I think that's a real meaty subject. So what would you say has been like the one thing um, – to take away from this that somebody could go and do that you'd say, look, you know, this is the thing really for, 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 as a first step. Yeah. Okay. So being a YouTube ads guy, I think there's um, two easy campaigns to build that whilst I can't explain it all over a podcast, uh, what I can do is say, do this campaign. It should work well for you. And it's one of two. Um, if you've already got traffic coming to your website through Facebook or SEO or like good quality traffic coming to your website already, and you're not yet following those, that traffic up on YouTube, build a YouTube ad remarketing um, uh, campaign. So all the people that go to your website who haven't yet signed up, follow those people up with YouTube ads. It's not a hard campaign to build, but when you build it, 
you just got basically to get in front of very high quality traffic. You spent a bit of money already, but it's going to be dirt cheap to advertise those people and build a really good experience in order to convert them again. So that's that if you have, if you have got traffic already, um, and we're talking about kind of a, a good amount of traffic, not ridiculous amount, or if you've got ridiculous amounts, great, but if you're, if you're less than a hundred a month, then don't bother. There's no point really doing it. Um, if you um, are in that stage where you're not really getting much traffic and you're new or you want to build your sites and you want to get kind of like get more traffic coming in, um, then what I would say is that go for um, a search campaign on YouTube. Um, but when I say search campaign, it's really saying uh, go for a pre-roll ad or an in-stream ad and get in front of other videos on YouTube. So it's building a in-stream campaign targeting placements. And if you have that in place, and, and we'll talk about the video in the next episode, but it doesn't have to be crazy good. It just seems to be a clear video about what you offer to those placements that are relevant, those video URLs that are relevant to your niche. And if you run that, um, you'll get very good quality traffic, very cheap quality traffic as well. And, um, and that's a, a, another great campaign to build. Um, those ones are like our stock things we do with clients every single day. That's like one of the first campaigns we build. Always performs well if we, if we, planned it out correctly. Um, but um, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not rocket science to get that one work, those two campaigns working. They're, they're kind of good, easy campaigns to build and uh, they normally provide a very good return on investment. Awesome. Mate, it's been awesome um, and um, certainly learned a lot. There's a lot of information to take away from that and um, there is, um, uh, I think that most people listening will probably be in awe to your knowledge of, uh, of YouTube um, with, with its depth and breadth that, uh, that uh, you know about. So um, I'm super excited to learn more and um, look forward to seeing you in the next episode. Cool, cool, cool. We'll talk about ads and how to create them based on what we've just talked about here, which would be good. Great. Thanks, Tom. That's all right.